We have quite a few visitors with us today, so welcome from wherever you are from. We had some people from Secret Harbour last sermon, so our last uh, service. So um, yeah, welcome all who are not regulars with us, and welcome regulars, our family, and welcome all of you online uh, listening in there. Let's pray. Oh, Father, our God, we do praise you and worship you for your Son, for your Spirit, for your Word, for your body, the Church, for so many blessings. You are a good and gracious and holy and majestic God, and we do praise you for who you are, for what you've done. Um, Lord, we, we thank you for the gift of your Word. We pray that as we open it and, and read it and hear it, that you would... Speak to our hearts by your spirit that you would change us, that you would increase our heart's desires for you, uh, that we would pursue you more closely, uh, that we would um, obey you, that we would love you and serve you uh, in, in what we think, in what we say, and what we do. So please speak to our hearts, we pray this day, in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, we are in Mark chapter 2, so if you've got uh, your Bibles there with you, in what a shape or form that is, uh, open up to Mark chapter 2. And these are some familiar verses, uh, and there's always a, a danger when we, when we read and um, study and hear over familiar verses that they, uh, they no longer stop us in our tracks. So... Um, yeah, uh, I pray that uh, this day these verses will speak freshly, freshly to us. Now, we're in Mark uh, chapter 2, but uh, in Mark chapter 1, uh, it, it shows us how Jesus and his disciples are in Galilee. And uh, Galilee is up in the top northwest corner of, of Israel, and it's the back blocks of Israel. It's uh, it's. Kilbilly territory, and uh, they even spoke with different accents uh, up there. So, if you were a Jew from Jerusalem and someone from Galilee came to and was talked to you, you'd pick up the accent. You go, oh, "You're not from Jerusalem. You're one of those guys from up there." And remember when Peter, uh, when Jesus was before the Sanhedrin, and uh, it was you know before he denied or when he was denying Jesus, uh, they said to him, you know, your, your accent gives you away. Uh, so this is the territory that Jesus and the disciples are in. And they've been in Capernaum, uh, and they've been basing themselves at Peter and Andrew's house. So that's where they based themselves, and they went out, and Jesus was preaching and teaching and, and healing people and, and casting out demons and and the crowds were just blossoming and, and growing around him because of what he was doing. And just at the end of chapter 1 there, he's just healed a leper. And uh, he tells the leper, don't tell anyone. Just go to the priests and you know, make the sacrifice that you should do. And, and uh, he didn't listen to Jesus' instructions. He just went out more and just proclaimed what Jesus did. And the crowds grew. So the, this the news of what this guy Jesus was doing was, was getting out there. And that leads us now into Mark chapter 2. So let's read that together. It says, When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So Andrew and uh, Peter's home, brothers. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. 
Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they were thus questioning within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven or to say, Rise, take your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed. And he went out before them so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Some amazing scene, you know, can you imagine it? Have you ever sort of imagined in your own heart and mind what, what that would have been like if you were present there and, and, and saw this happen? You know, just people gobsmacked and the, the scribes, you know, fuming. Um, it's an amazing scene. So in verse 1, it tells us that Jesus is, and the disciples, they're returning to the home base, back to and Simon and Andrew's home. It's jam-packed. It's, it's shoulder to shoulder. It's standing room only. Uh, and, you know, here comes these four guys carrying this guy on, you know, mat, bed, whatever it looked like. They're carrying him. And they can't get in. They see the crowd and, you know, the crowd is like, no, we're not going to let you through. You know, we've got our spot here. And... We're not letting you in. You know, we, we, we've come to see this guy and we're not letting you in. So, you know, they, they see this and they think, well, we can, we can get up on the roof. And back in the, the, the first century there, their homes often had these staircases that uh, were outdoor, outside staircases so they could climb up and get onto the roof and often above the rafters they would have all the clay packed down and you could actually stand up there and you know particularly um, you know even when the evenings are hot in summer they could sit up there and it was it was cooler but Luke 5 tells us that they cleared away the tiles um, so they're, they're ripping tiles off the roof and it's Peter's house and we know Peter is a guy who calls a spade a spade and you can probably imagine what's going through at least his head if not his mouth what are you doing to my roof because remember they've got to lower the guy down and he's lying on a mat so they're, they're not ripping off just one or two tiles they're getting rid of a lot of tiles um, and so Peter I'm sure uh, was going what is going on here and maybe even verbally said that, who knows. Now verse 5, it says there that Jesus sees their faith. Alright? He can supernaturally perceive it, but he can see it because it's, it's in action, isn't it? It's practical. They're living their faith. They're carrying this guy to Jesus knowing that he can heal. So it's, it's, a, it's a faith that can be seen. And isn't that encouraging us for us today that you know, when, when we step out in faith to do things for Christ, he, he sees our faith. He, he knows it. He perceives it. Uh, so it's an encouragement for us today. He sees our faith and he wants to strengthen and build uh, and encourage our faith. And we know that we are saved by faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone. But that faith is a lived out faith, isn't it? It's not a faith that is alone in that we, we live it out. You know, what we put our roots into brings out fruit. So if our faith is in Christ, then that will bear fruit in the lives of those around us. So saving faith, it involves our head, it involves our heart, and it involves our hands as we you know, intellectually understand the truth 
of, the, of God's word and it permeates our heart and transforms our heart, cleanses our heart, that then just comes out of us. We, we live it practically in how we interact with other people. Jesus says to this guy, they're, they're coming for this guy to be healed. That's their, their primary purpose. They're, they're coming here to be healed, for this guy to be healed. Their, their friend, they want to see him healed. And he says, my son, your sins are forgiven. It's, a, it's an astounding response to their, their faith to be healed. He, he's not giving them what they want straight away. He makes this statement, you, my son, your sins are forgiven. And this man, he's, he's imprisoned by paralysis. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a, a horrible thing, you know, if you've ever experienced, you know, even just broken arms and things that don't work, broken legs, you know, the things that don't work properly, it's, 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 and, and this, this, this picture of this paralysis is a fitting picture of all humanity's bondage to sin and his, uh, his release from, from paralysis is a vivid picture of the release of sin's guilt and grip, you know, this, this hold that it has on humanity. So Jesus, in saying, my sons, your, my son, your sins are forgiven, he's granting full pardon from divine judgment by God. Uh, so this is an extraordinary response by Jesus uh, who, 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 for this guy who comes for physic, physical healing. And his healing is going far deeper than just the outward bodily uh, paralysis that he has. It's, it's actually driving deep to the hardcore issue of the crippling effect of sin. Um, and therefore our broken relationship that we have with God and therefore our deep need of forgiveness and healing of our relationship with God. So in the Old Testament, you know, the, these people that were there at that time, they knew that there were prophets that could, um, you know, speak God's word and could do uh, miracles of healing but when it came to sin, they could never say, you know, your sins are forgiven. They could say, You're, the Lord has put your sins away. If you think back to Nathan the prophet, when he came to uh, David to, you know, uh, challenge him of his sin with Bathsheba and his, his murder of Uriah, when Jesus confronted with his sin and repented, Nathan said to him, the Lord has put your sin away. But it wasn't Nathan forgiving him. He was just pointing to the fact that God was, uh, had forgiven him. And here we have Jesus, prophet, priest, and king, forgiving sins directly. And this is something that's just gobsmacking for them. And like, this is completely out of left field, something they've never seen before by anyone saying to them directly, your sins are forgiven. And in verses 6 and 7, uh, we see the scribes see instantly the implications of what Jesus said. You know, they, they hear this and they go, hang on a sec, you, you can't do that. Only God, only God can forgive sins. So they were correct in their theology by saying, hang on, whoa, whoa, only God can do this. I mean, obviously they don't know who Jesus is, but they were wrong in that they were accusing Jesus of blaspheming. So let's have a look at some of these verses that, that, that speak about God being the one who forgives. In Psalm 51, in verses 1 to 4, it says there, the psalmist here, and, and hear the psalmist's heart. As we read through these words of the psalmist, hear the heart of the psalmist. Have mercy on me, O God. So he's crying out. He knows that the only place he can get true forgiveness is through God. Have mercy on me, God, 
according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So, I mean, when we sin against people, uh, we, we do sin against them. Okay, and we, you know, we, we commit an offence against them and they can forgive us. And when people hurt us, we should extend forgiveness to them. But firstly and foremostly, our sin is against God himself. And therefore, ultimately, it is only he can, who can forgive us of our sins. Psalm 130 in verses 1 to 4 as well, it says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O God. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. So again, the psalmist is proclaiming this truth that it's God ultimately is the only one who can, who can forgive sins. And then in Psalm 103, we have a, 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 a linking together of forgiveness and uh, disease. Psalm 103, verses 2 to 3, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of your iniquity, who heals your diseases. So the psalmist there is putting together forgiveness and diseases and healing them together. And this really harks back to the fall, doesn't it? When, you know, when Adam and Eve sinned, they corporately led all of humanity and this whole planet into uh, you know, a rebellion against God and therefore, you know, the curse entered the world that came from this sickness, disease, death, and worst of all, the broken relationship with humanity, with God. So in this, in this sense, disease and sin are linked together, harking back to the fall. And the ancient world held this belief that uh, if you were physically ill, it was a result of your sin. So there's this cause and effect. If you are sinful, well, then that's going to result in, uh, in illness, in sickness. And from a pragmatic point of view, it's sort of partly true today, isn't it? I mean, if, if you, you know, hammer alcohol and, and abuse that, well then, and you do it for long enough, well, ultimately that's going to have some health effects on your body. Similarly, with smoking, if you hammer the cigarettes throughout your life, well, there's going to be some, some, some bad results from that. But the first century Jews, they also they believed that sickness and sin were actually indissolubly linked together. So a sick man was one who had sinned and therefore had God's curse on them. So that's what they believed back then, that if you were sick, really you're getting your just desserts. It's a result of your sin. A bit like the, the sort of the Hindu karma sort of idea. That's, that's what they believed back then. But we, if we remember in John 9, remember uh, uh, the, the man that was um, uh, born blind? And Jesus heals him. Remember that in John 9? And uh, after he is healed and the, the Pharisees drag him in and say, or well, they drag his parents in first and they, you know, question them and they, they don't want to give an answer and then they drag the guy in and uh, they, they question him. And, he's, and he basically, he says to them, he, he gives them a lecture and he says to the Pharisees, referring to Jesus, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And do you remember the response of the Pharisees? It's, it's horrible. It's ugly. It's, 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 he says, you were steeped in sin 
from birth, you know, because you were born blind. So you look, look at the horrible position and the horrible sin that must be in your life that you were born this way. You were steeped in sin from birth. How dare you lecture us? You, you see the venom and the, 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 it's the hard-heartedness that's coming out of the Pharisees and pointing the finger at this guy. But earlier on, remember the, uh, the disciples asked Jesus, was it this man or was it his parents that sinned? Because that, they, they're, they're in this mindset as well. They're in this worldview. You're sick. Well, it's a result of your sin. So they asked G Jesus, was it him or was it his parents that sinned that he's you know, been born this way? And Jesus says, neither. He says he's been born blind so that the works of God would be displayed among you. So Jesus says, no, you know, our, our, our sickness today, we can't say, oh, I'm sick, therefore, you know, it's, it's a result of my sin. Jesus breaks that. In Isaiah 33, it, uh, it looks forward to the, the messianic kingdom reign. And in verse 24... Uh, uh, Isaiah says there, and it's, it's looking to the, to the, the new Jerusalem that's, that's coming, and he says, And no inhabitant will say, I am sick. The people who dwell there will be forgiven their iniquity. So you can see there this, this, this freedom from death and decay and sickness and more importantly, from uh, you know the results of sin, forgiven of iniquity. All right, back to chapter two of Mark. Now, in verse eight, there, um, Jesus, you know, he says, verse eight, and immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said, said to them, Why do you question these things in your Hearts. So Jesus perceives this in his divine nature. He can read their mind and he knows exactly what they're thinking. All right. And I'm sure their body language would have given it away as well. And he's talking about their hearts, which again, you know, it's, it's our core problem, isn't it? The core problem of humanity is our hearts. Um, and Jesus wants our hearts and that's what he came to die in our place uh, that our hearts could be uh, turned to him and drawn to him in verse 9 he says to them which is easier verse 9 which is easier to say to the paralytic your sins are forgiven or to say rise take up your bed and walk so on the surface, it's, it's, it's easier, isn't it, to say, uh, I forgive you, than to heal. But on a much deeper level, it's actually harder to say that your sins are forgiven completely by God. And in reality, they're both difficult to heal and to forgive and humanly impossible. It's something only God can do. But forgiveness is invisible, isn't it? I mean, if someone sins against us and, and we say, I forgive you, well, it, that's a, an invisible thing. And, and people go, well, I won't really know that until I see how you treat me in the future. And if you treat me well, well I'll know you've forgiven me. Uh, and if you don't treat me well, well, I'm going to question whether you've really forgiven me. So the forgiveness is invisible. And so in a sense... You know, the crowd looking on and going, well, we don't know whether he's forgiven. You've said God has forgiven him, but we can't see that. that that's invisible. Um, and so what Jesus is going to do here, he's going to heal, which is visible, and he's going to link the two together. So Jesus here, he hears what the, uh, the, the scribes are saying, and he's actually going to take them head on. He's going to come down, in a sense, to their level and he's going to answer 
their critique of him. So basically, Jesus' response to the scribes is, you say, I have no right to forgive this guy's sins. You actually believe this man is ill because he is a sinner and he can't be cured until he is forgiven. He says, okay then, that's what you believe? Watch this. And blows everything out of the water and people are gobsmacked. So Jesus here is putting his credibility on the line. He's directly linking God's forgiveness, which is invisible, I can't see that, with healing, which is visible. So he's linking the two together and saying, because I'm healing this guy and I have the power and authority to do it, I also have the power and the authority to forgive him of his sins. So Jesus' healing here, it's a dramatic and it's an inescapable uh, visual aid. It's a sign to reinforce his claim that he has the authority to forgive sins. Verse 10, it says, But that you may know that the Son, he uses this phrase, this title, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, and then he goes on and says, you know, rise, take up your mat and walk. So let's have a look at this, this title, the Son of Man. He, Jesus used a lot, it's all woven throughout all the, the, the Gospels, the Son of Man. And it's a bit of a nebulous sort of saying. A lot of people wouldn't have understood what he was saying, but those that knew the Word of God would have gone, hang on, we've heard this title before. So let's go to Daniel 7 and see why Jesus uses this title. He, he, it's a self-designation. He, he titles himself as the Son of Man. So in Daniel 7 and verses 13 to 14, it says there, so this is Daniel speaking, he's having a vision. God is opening his mind to see this. I saw in the night visions, and behold, the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And, he, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So when Jesus uses this, this title, this phrase, this term of himself, the Son of Man, he's saying, I am that Son of Man, the Messiah to come, you know, who will rule and people will worship and serve forever. Verses 11 and 12, so what we see here is he says to this, this paralytic, this, this uh, paralysed man, you know, take up uh, your, your bed and go home. And he does that and the people are going, we have never seen anything like this. And the proof is now in the pudding, isn't it? He does what only God can do. He heals and he also extends forgiveness to this man. And thereby he claims the authority of God. And there's only two responses left now, isn't there? For the people that are standing there, there's only two things that they can do. They can either say, well, he's healed the guy and he's forgiven him. He has the authority to forgive sins. This is no normal, common man. There's something way bigger beyond what we what we can understand here with, with Jesus. Um, and so we see the scribes, they harden their hearts to it. They, they see the reality of what Jesus has done, but their hearts are too hard, their eyes are closed, they, they cannot uh, see it. And it's the same for us today as well, isn't it? 
we see this today and we're left with the decision. Well, which, you know, the, the road parts now. Which road are we going to take? Are we going to accept the authority of Jesus? That he's the one that can forgive sins. That he can, he's the one that can heal and restore human relationship with God? Or are we going to turn our backs on that? Um, and so this particular miracle, he's performed many miracles prior to this, but this one is really the first punch right in the face of the religious elite, isn't it? Um, and there are, uh, most of them are very corrupt uh, religious elite. And really what Jesus did when he performed this miracle and made this, this statement that your sins, son, your sins are forgiven, he's really signing his, his death warrant uh, because he's, claim, he's claiming authority over the whole religious establishment. And they charged him with blasphemy, which is the worst sin and punishable by death, de death by stoning. And let's have a look at that, because that's exactly what happens when Jesus is brought before the, the Sanhedrin. Mark 14, chapter 14, verses 61 and 64. This is Jesus, but he remained silent and made no answer. And again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man. There's the title, Daniel 7, the son of man, seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving of death. Uh, Jim, maybe if you uh, give out the, the elements now, that would be good. We're drawing this all to a, to a close. So, what do we now do with these verses and Jesus' claim today? It was made very clear to the people back then what uh, he was claiming, the authority that he was claiming. The thing we need to understand, that the forgiveness that God has towards guilty sinners is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performs. You know, greater than all the miracles he's done, this forgiveness of sin and therefore cleansing and a right relationship with God is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performs. And the reason for that is fourfold. One, firstly, is that it meets our greatest need. This forgiveness of our sin is our greatest need. Number two, it costs the greatest price. It cost Jesus his life. He suffered in our place. He bore our sin. He bore our guilt and our shame. And over and above that, he bore the, the righteous wrath of God upon himself in our place. Number three brings the greatest blessing. There is no greater blessing than being forgiven and restored and made right and having a reconciled relationship with God. And at number four, it brings eternal results. Eternal results. Not just here and now for us that we can know his forgiveness and his cleansing and his reconciling love. We can experience that right now. But it's forever. It's eternal. So Jesus rights the wrong of the fall. And so the issue that Jesus is pressing, and he's pressing it hard upon these Pharisees, these Pharisees, Scribes, they make it a, a, a charge against Jesus and he, he, he hits them head on with his response and he shows them, you know, in no uncertain terms by the healing and by the forgiveness that he has authority to forgive sins. And, you know, he, he has this authority and we now, today, have the same choice as the people back then. What are we going to do with this? What are we going to do with this? 
Do we accept his authority? Do we bow to his authority? Do we worship him for his authority and obey him in his authority? Or do we, our hearts hard and we turn? So Jesus came as a suffering servant. That's you know, woven through Mark. He comes as a suffering servant and he shows us, he demonstrates to us what true humility is. But he does not suffer from false humility. We suffer from false humility all the time, don't we? You know, when people congratulate us or say, oh, you know, this, and it's like, oh, I don't know. This false humility just sort of pours out of us. But Jesus doesn't suffer from uh, false humility. He is the heavenly son of man revealed in Daniel 7, and he, he proclaims it clearly, and he claims the authority and the deity of God. So let's think about this. Jesus decided where we were born. So wherever we were born, whether it's Albany or another country, another state, Jesus decided where we were going to be born. He decided when we were going to be born. You know, it could have been in 1850 or 532 or, you know, but he decided the year and the date, the day we were born. Uh, he owns the ground we walk on. The air that we breathe, it's his. The food that we eat is his. You know, the blood that flows through our veins, it is his. Every heartbeat, he owns it. And one day he'll say, last one, and we will stand before him. So Jesus decides where we will spend eternity. He has authority as judge. And therefore, our response to his authority is vitally important. Everyone, every single person on the planet, we have to decide what we're going to do with Jesus' authority. He has the power to forgive sins. And so this God and this Saviour is not one to be taken for granted. He has absolute claim on our lives. He has the authority to have absolute claim on everything about our lives. And so it's deadly serious. So if Jesus is not your king, you have some very serious business to do with him. I was trying to pick a picture of you know something serious. And the one I came up with is, imagine, you know, you're going to fill up the car at the petrol station and you get there and you look out the window and there's a kid playing with matches at the, um, the, the Bowser. <laughs> You'd probably hit the floor of the accelerator and get out of there as quickly as you can before the mushroom cloud appears above the petrol station. So it's, it's that serious. It's that serious, you know, that... Jesus has absolute authority over our lives. And, you know, what we do with that is vitally important. And, you know, as we go on in our Christian life, things, you know, we can just, it can become routine. And we just, oh, we go to church and we, we sing songs and, and it gets, can get dry and it can get empty of, you know, the truth and the value of, of who Jesus is. And so we have to keep praying, you know, Lord, keep opening my eyes, keep softening my heart, keep revealing to me who you are and the truth of your gospel and the beauty of it and, and your beauty so that we see him for who he is and we worship him for who he is. So never forget, never forget that the real miracle of the Christian faith is that your sins are forgiven. If you've bowed your knee to Christ, you've trusted in what he did on the cross, and you're born again of his spirit, you, your sins are forgiven. You've been redeemed. Your, your relationship with God is now reconciled, and we can have a living relationship by his spirit with him. Uh, there's a, a, a Maori uh, gospel singer, Steve Aparani. He's got this really powerful song. It's called, if I, my memory serves me correct, it's called It's No Miracle. And it's all based on this 
what we've just read out of Mark 2, one, verses 1 to 12. And it's the song is written, it's, he's not actually singing, he's got music going and he's just telling the story from the, from the mind of the guy who's paralysed. So, you know, he tells the story, I'm, I'm being carried in by these guys and they're lowering me down through the roof. And then Jesus looks at me and his eyes just pierce into my soul and, and he says he sees my sin and, he, and he, it's like he said I want to just crawl away like a, you know, a, a, a insect under a rock because he sees my sin and he knows I'm guilty and, he, and, I, and the, the paralytic knows he, he can like, you know, chop my head off. I'm worthy of that. He can execute me. And instead, he says, my son, your sins are forgiven. And so this, so what, at the end of this song by Steve Baffarani says, here's the real miracle. He said, the real miracle is my sins have been forgiven. So I would rather see one person saved than a, a thousand blind people, you know, miraculously healed in, by faith in Jesus that they get their sight back or a thousand crippled people come out of their wheelchairs I would rather see one person saved and on Friday we, we witnessed Caroline's uh, baptism she was here in the first service and um, it was so special just you know she, she wanted to be baptised and um, you know, after she came out of the waters, I just remember she goes, I'm born again. You know, it was just, you could just see the elation of her heart. I'm born again. You know, I'm washed clean. I'm right with the Saviour now. I have eternal life. You know, that, that joy of her rejoicing in what her Saviour has done for her, it's so special. And it's what church is all about. You know, it's, it's, it's the privilege of of being a part of that. And, and Jesus asks us, he invites us to this privilege to be part of his kingdom work. He does the saving, but he's asked us to share the gospel, to speak his truth into people's lives with love so that they, they can understand as well. Let's give thanks. Lord Jesus, we do praise you and thank you for what you did on the cross for us. Lord, you, you bore the, the filth and the, the stench uh, of our sin, of our guilt, of our shame. You bore the wrath of the Father, Lord, our punishment in our place, that we, the guilty, could go free. And not just free, but cleansed and made righteous and reconciled with the Father. Lord, help us never to forget just the, the awesome privilege it is to be forgiven, to be your child, uh, to know you. Lord, help us never to forget that. May, may it never get weary, may it never get dry. Lord, keep drawing us to yourself. And Lord, as we, as we celebrate what you did on the cross, your body broken in our place, Lord, as, as the wheat is crushed and ground into a powder to make bread, that's what happened to you, that we may eat you, the, the, the bread of life. Lord, in your blood poured out for us, that we might be cleansed and reconciled and and made right. So, Lord, we thank you for your body broken, your blood poured out for us. Thank you for your, uh, this bread representing your body. Let's eat the bread now. And Lord, we do thank you for this grape juice that uh, represents, Lord, your, again, your body crushed uh, as a grape is crushed and the juice flows out. Lord, we, we thank you that your blood uh, poured out in abundance 
to wash clean sinners like us, that we would be made righteous in your sight, reconciled, Lord, that we might have eternal life, that we might know you forever, serve you forever, and worship you forever with great joy. Help us, uh, Lord, help us, we pray, and we thank you.